What course would you say you're most excited for? Well, of the courses I've taught, the Sermon on the Mount, I would say. Yeah, that's a deadly course. So I did a course on Nietzsche. That was fun. It's half of Beyond and Evil. I'll do the other half at a, at a different time. But the Sermon on the Mount will be released relatively soon. And that was, that was great fun because it's a very, it's a, it's a wonderful bit of literature to take part. So, and it is an instruction manual and, and it's ex an extremely useful instruction manual. So it was very fun to go through that. You know, if you're teaching and you're genuinely teaching, you're learning when you teach. And that's also the case with the lectures. And I think all the people who are lecturing for Peterson Academy are doing that, you know, and this, this. I've been a, I'm in a fortunate position because I can identify top level lecturers and thinkers everywhere. And almost invariably when we reach out to them, they say, yes. So that's a really good mm -hmm. deal. It's, I'm sure you experienced that to some degree with your podcast as your mm -hmm. success is mounted, the probability that people will say yes increases. And there's a lot of disenchantment, especially among the great professors with the current state of our educational institutions. And so we offer them a pretty good deal. It's like, okay, here's the deal. Come to our studio. We'll find an audience of people who actually want to hear what you have to say. That's why they're there. And so, and then you can teach whatever you want at the highest level that you're capable of, and we'll pay you better than you can, you'll be paid by, by your university, and it'll be better than a book deal, and you'll be able to teach more people. And we'll treat you extremely well while you're there well, that's a good deal. And so people come down there and they're, they're very happy because they're treated well and they want to come back. And so Larry Arn from Hillsdale taught a course on Churchill, which I think is really funny because like, are you already going to find a course on Churchill at the typical university? I don't think so. Um, we had one of the members of the Houses of Lord teach a course on great leaders in history. Like that's just not happening at the universities because nobody buys the great leader of history theory anymore resentful, bloody Luciferian intellects. It'll be interesting to see what professors will do, exceptional professors, when given free reign to talk about whatever they like to talk about. Well, that is what you want to see. That's what right, they're without doing when they're teaching. Bureaucracy and politics that mm. comes with being in a you know university. Right, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Well, one of the things that it's done for me is, you know, so when I used to teach my personality course, I would cover Freud in like an hour and a half. Well, that's, that's not helpful. I mean, I can understand why mm -hmm. it's a survey course and all that, but I, I was going to do a course on Piaget, Jean Piaget, the developmental psychologist and several other thinkers, but the course just ended up being about Piaget because I had eight hours and I could just talk about Piaget. So it's quite deep and I can just endlessly do that. And so that's a great opportunity. It's such fun. And if you're lecturing properly, like a lecture isn't the deliverance of knowledge to like the empty shells of the recipients. What, what you're doing properly if you're lecturing is learning. So I'm with the course on Nietzsche, for example, I did the same thing with the Sermon on the Mount. You know, I'd read a section and then actively think about it. It wasn't like I, I mean, I was prepared because I'd been preparing for 40 years, mm -hmm. but I didn't have the notes at hand. I wanted the revelations of the meaning to strike me in the moment. That, that's part of that utility of that ability to concentrate on the moment if your orientation is right. So what's the goal? You walk on a stage for a lecture and think, okay, well, I, I'm, I'm trying to answer an interesting question with the Sermon on the Mount. It would be, well, what's the essential message of the Sermon on the Mount? That's a hard question. It's a, it's a central, uh, what would you say? It's a foundational document of the West. And so, well, what, what is it? What does it mean? Well, let's find out. And then that's the exploration in the course. And it's the same with Beyond Good and Evil. You know, I was taking pieces of it, sentences, because you can talk about any given sentence of Nietzsche for like a month because it's so unbelievably dense. You know, he was very ill, very ill when he was writing. And so he couldn't write for long. And so he would think and think and think and think and think mm -hmm. and then write one sentence. And all that thought was compacted into that sentence. And then he made like a whole book many books out of those sentences. It's just incredibly dense and entertaining to unpack. So I'm excited about the course on Nietzsche and I'm excited about the course on, oh, and I did, I redid my Maps of Meaning lecture series 
and I managed to condense it to eight hours, which is the best. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> it took about 30, 32 hours. Gosh. So I think that was the most effective exposition of those ideas that I've managed. Um, Samuel Andreev's course on music has got rave reviews. Jonathan Paggio's lecture. Jonathan Paggio is a remarkable person. Everything he says is worth listening to. It's like every word. Every time I listen to him, I learn something new and profound. And that's very rare. You know, I'm at the point in my life where if I read a book, it's it's somewhat rare for the book to have an idea that I don't know. But then I talk to Paggio, it's like everything he says is something new. Got to find out what he's reading. Mm-hmm. You got to find out what he's well, reading. Well, he's reading like Orthodox literature from the from the Middle Ages. Mostly. Okay. So it's arcane, you know, which is partly why he, and he also has a tremendous background knowledge of the world of art. And so he can bring those two things together. But that is what he's reading. And so um, John Vervanke is lecturing, James Orr, um, Brian Keating on cosmology. We have a great lineup. And it's such fun. It's, it's such a fun project. Like, we're quite excited at the moment because we put a lot of money into this project, multiple millions of dollars of, of personal money. And we have no idea if it was going to be financially successful, if it would work. Like, is there a market for it? Who the hell knows? Did we get the price right? It's $450 a year which is dirt cheap by university standards. We have 10,000 students already in the first week just for pre-enrollment. And it's very likely that we'll be accredited. So I think we'll have the best of both worlds because we'll be able to offer people, I think, the best courses that have ever been filmed, both in terms of content, but also in terms of production quality. I'm very happy with my daughter, Michaela, and her husband, Jordan Fuller. They built this studio, which is a hard thing to do. And they brought in a production team and they hired editors and, and it's really good. It's, it was, the trailers were, they exceeded my expectations, which were high. I wanted to be sure that he had the best courses ever, but they're like by far the best courses. Yeah. If it's anything like the trailers. It is. is. They are like the trailers. That's the thing is the trailers are actually, they're not puffery for something that's basically dull. The trailers look like the courses. They're very tightly edited. They're full of illustrations. Hmm. You know, we got lucky because when we filmed the courses, we filmed all of our professors against a white wall with no edges. And at the same time, these AI systems emerged that could do custom-made illustrations for, if you know how to do use them, every course has its own style sheet. Like, it's integrated, so the offerings have a cohesion, but they all have their own style sheet. They're beautifully illustrated. We can fill the background behind the professor with commentary and images and words. And that technology only emerged like six months ago. So, so that cool. was perfect timing. Good timing. And the universities themselves are doing everything they can to burn themselves to the ground as rapidly as possible. We hardly even have to market because every day some university does something cataclysmically stupid and expensive. You know, what are our hopes? Maybe we can educate a million people. Maybe we can educate a hundred million people. Who knows? Right? Because there's an unlimited market. The price is very low. It's universally accessible. We're going to be able to translate all the courses into the world's major languages. That's already at hand. There's some expense in it. But if we generate enough capital, that's irrelevant. And we probably will by the looks of things. I mean, who knows? But 10,000 pre-enrollments in the first week is quite promising and people have actually been positive about the price. So it's, I mean, it's very inexpensive. People are happy about the price, which means that maybe we undershot it slightly, but well, because maybe if you get it right, some people. So where do you balance the price on that versus getting more revenue to be able to reinvest back? Pricing is very, very hard. I mean, there's a lot of things to take into account, right? Because you might say free, well, that's a, free is a stupid price. Yeah. Free means the, your platform will be invaded with parasites and bots, right? Because there's no... Success rate is going to be very low. Well, it's just, it's just not a good price. First of all, people are skeptical of anything that's free. Second, people don't want something for nothing if they have a moral compass. Third, if the price is reasonable and not too low, 
then no one who isn't committed will participate. And we have a social media platform that's part of it. And wouldn't it be nice to have a social media platform that had all the benefits of social media, but that only contained people that were actually committed to the ideal, which would be the expansion of knowledge. Well, so the price serves as a barrier that way, right? Because you're not going to do it if you're just casual or you only want to cause trouble. And so that's a good thing. And then we, well, you want to you want to price it high enough so that you can expand rapidly and continue to develop. And you want to price it so that if you produce a profit, you can use the profit to generate mm -hmm. new enterprises. There's lots of, we want to integrate my son's program essay, which helps people write. We want to integrate that with the platform. And we have all sorts of ideas for growth and that requires mm -hmm. capital. And so pricing decisions are very difficult. The way you solve that is you, you charge what the market can bear. That's the rule. And there is a better rule than that. And why? Because every single person out there who's deciding whether to purchase something is making a very large number of calculations with every purchasing decision. And there's no way that you can second guess that. Like you can't replace that with some rationalization. Hmm. So what's this worth? Well, we, we sort of went for somewhere between 20 and $200 a month. You know, that was the initial parameters, right? And it took a long time to calibrate down to 450. Why 450? Well, it's not nothing. It's, a, it's more expensive than the typical Netflix offering, for mm -hmm. example. So it distinguishes it, us from them to some degree. But also, if it's successful, it generates enough capital so that we should be able to expand our offerings very rapidly. You know, and capitalism gets a bad name because people are foolish in their conceptions of money. It's like, well, who needs all that money? Well, you know, your typical capitalist, your atypical capitalist, Elon Musk, he's not Scrooge McDuck. Like, he's not swimming around in a money bin full of coins, right? All he's doing with his money is pursuing more opportunities. And if you generate profit, then, well, you could leave, live a life of parasitical hedonism, but, you know, if you have something that's halfway is better to do, why the hell would you do that? The, we have the opportunity in front of us. We have the opportunity in front of us to hypothetically bring the best higher education has to offer to like 100 million people. Well, how could you possibly imagine anything more interesting and rewarding than that? Like, that's what the profit is for. It's like, do I want a Ferrari? Not really. They're too low. I'm old, <laughs> you know, and like I have some nice things. I have some nice houses and that's good, but you have to put your money somewhere. Mostly we put it into more enterprises and, and then it's fun to see if you can make those work, right? Because we bit off very complex problems. Can we bring higher education to many, many people at the highest possible quality at the lowest possible cost. That's a very interesting set of problems. And at the moment, it looks like the answer to that is yes. We have a number of jurisdictions who are interested in accrediting us. And as long as we can negotiate the bureaucratic hurdles, then we should have a full-fledged university, including accreditation, in six months. And even if accreditation doesn't work out because the bureaucratic impediments are too great, we'll just negotiate with corporations to accept the credentialing because the credentialing yeah. will be real. That's where I think education is going anyway. It's online. Like well, I learn a lot from just watching YouTube videos. And I feel like that that is the most in-depth that you could get sometimes in way more detail. And, and lots anyway. of jobs aren't requiring official like college degrees. Well, days. it's partly mm -hmm. because the college degrees don't signify what they did. Yeah. And will ours signify that? Yes. Oh, well, also just for the sake of full disclosure, let's say there's two pathway, pathways you could walk down if you enroll in Peterson Academy. You could just take courses like you were listening to YouTube videos, let's say, or you could take the, the exams and, and walk through the accreditation process. You don't have to do that. And we actually don't know what the market, comparative market is. A lot of people have asked whether they could take the courses without the exams. Now, so we don't know if the exams are like, will it be 25% of the people who actually want to mm -hmm. work towards accreditation or 10% or 60%? We have no idea. It could be quite low because I, it could be quite a low number. 
Don't know. Depends on how many people just want to learn for the sake of learning. Now, I am curious about this. Do people retain information better in person? No, I don't think there's any evidence for that. Um, I don't think we know enough about the situational determinants of retention to decide. I suspect there are factors other than in-person versus remote that determine retention. Probably distraction is my well, guess. Sure. And l l level of engagement with material, something like that. Sure. So, but no, I don't think that's a problem. Well, the other thing too, is that most university lectures are very low quality. So at the typical university, especially the bigger universities, the research-oriented universities, you can you get along quite fine and be a terrible teacher. And so I would say at the typical large state school, 5% of the courses are high quality, you know, and then 40% are okay. And then, you know, there's half that, mm. you know, it's just death to sit through. And there's no excuse for that. That's another thing that we can do at a minimum is raise the bar for the universities. You know, there were universities, the Ivy Leagues, they could have done this 20 years ago. It's like, who are the best lecturers? Because if the other thing about in person, if you're lecturing to a thousand people, it's not in person. You, you know what I mean? At some yeah. point, yeah. there's so many people there that it's impersonal. It might as well be replaced by video, as far as I could tell. In fact, you can listen to video at twice as fast. Yeah. That's a big deal, or four times as fast. You can review it. Our, our exams are set up in a very interesting way, so multiple choice exams. But each question will be timestamped with the lecture. So if you get the question wrong, you can just go to the lecture and you can find out. So you'll be able That's to use fine. the exams to teach you, right? And so, yeah, it's very exciting. We've got another 50 courses lined up. We're going to produce at least three a month, and we, we might be able to ramp up past that. Um, and we have some wild plans in place, too, for lectures that I can't discuss yet, but we have some truly revolutionary ideas. And I don't say that lightly. And they're very likely to occur, assuming that, you know, the enrollment rate continues. And so I'm very happy about it. Um, it's, it's, it's gone better than I could have hoped, actually. I was quite stunned by the trailers. The trailers? Yeah, yeah. I mean, hey, they, 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 yeah, trailers, well, come yeah. on. You can't. Those trailers were something. Yeah, they're deadly. And I, they're all like that. Like every single one of them. It's like they're punchy. They're cool. They're, they've got this, like with Greg Hurwitz's course, it's on, on narrative construction because he's a novelist. It's got this film noir look, pulp fiction look from the 1950s that's cool. The music is well-timed. The editing is really tight. The trailers are coherent. And the professors are... We have great professors, and I think that well, we're going to set up a system where we find the best professors in the world and give them carte blanche to teach what they want. That's such a good deal. So, Have you considered having a financial literacy course? Oh, definitely. Because I that's, think that's that a, is a very oh, definitely. Advanced. Well, I also want to bring on to the platform um, economists from the Austrian school, mm -hmm. Mises and Hayek, and teach people the basis, the basics of free market exchange. And I would so love that. Oh yeah, Absolutely. that's definitely that's, that's it. Definitely, but also modern day literacy is is, yeah, is just extremely, an everyday personal finance. Yeah, well, like and is, well, not only personal finances, but like an orientation towards financial management and success. Yes, mm -hmm. you know, like people think, for example, that profit is a dirty word. It's like, well, that's insane. Profit is what enables you to grow. Like that's just if you have that attitude towards profit. Basically, what you're doing is punishing yourself morally and ideologically for doing your job well. Well, that's not, that's going to demoralize you. So that's not good. It's no, it's like pick a hard target, figure out how to solve it, offer the best services you possibly can. And if you can generate money, that indicates you're doing it efficiently and you can take the capital and go do something else interesting with it. And so, and there's no end to that. Like, there's no end to the number of courses we can offer and the number of professors we can bring onto the platform. And obviously, as it's successful, you know, it's going to be even easier for us now to attract high-quality lectures because we can say, well, this is what your course will look like and this is how many students you'll have. Like, who the hell's going to say no to that if they actually want to teach? It's such a good deal. You know, if you write an academic book, you're lucky if 5,000 people buy it. Like, really, that's a major success. And maybe half of those read it. Well, with a good course, maybe you'll have an audience of a million. It's a thousand yeah. times more successful. 
So, yeah, we're very excited about it. And, and it looks like it might be working. So, you know, and soon we're going to have monthly payment structures and I'm going to negotiate with corporations to offer scholarships. And so, hmm. you know, one of the things we'd like to do is find the 10,000 smartest young people in the world, right? Because there's all these developing countries where there are geniuses yes. lying latent here and there. They're not, their cognitive resources aren't being utilized. You know, there's some Elon Musk in India in some poor family. Maybe he'll never have the opportunity to move ahead and to offer the world what he could offer. We are in a position where we can be able to find people like that. I'm going to go to corporations and say, like, buy a thousand scholarships. We'll screen people. We'll bring bright people in from all over the developing world and educate. I love that. Then we'll be able to hook them up with potential employers. I mean, we'll, we'll set up a platform where we shouldn't be able to identify the smartest and hardest working people in the world. It shouldn't be that hard to hook them up with employers. It's like, look, they're stellar. They work hard. They're committed. They're all in. They're educated. They're not ideologically adult. It's like, you want to hire them? Would you pay for the privilege of hiring them? That, that would be incredible to utilize your tests with employment. That you could yeah. basically just select, hey, these are the people that we believe are the most qualified based on our rankings. Right. And just have them there. Right. Well, that's, in that's such an efficient society where do. it's like, yep, you just pick and choose like that person. Right. That would be incredible. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's been a dream for since 1992. I talked to my partner, Daniel, about building an online psychometric battery that would enable us to find the smartest people in the world who don't have any opportunities. Like, we don't want to wait, let that kind of genius go to waste. That's mm -hmm. foolish. Deadly foolish. You know, what's one person like Elon Musk worth? What's he worth? $150 billion? Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a thousand people out there like that. Because yeah. there could be. 